back in the day, the paras were kind of a bit, bit of a pariah in the army. They weren't uh, particularly well liked by the rest of the army. They had an elitist attitude, understandably so, because the training was hard. There are no words I can use at this moment to describe my true feelings. I mean, amongst them, there were civilians. Nothing to do with any dispute with anyone. And a padre, a Roman Catholic. But it's hard, Chris, because you know that the biggest weapon of these people or the club, of which we, you and I are not members, is diversion tactics. Keep everybody occupied, keep them worried, keep them in fear. I've got like the Guildford Four and all that sort of stuff and the, the hunger strikes and everything. One thing I'm sure, it will not weaken the resolve of this government to put an end to this type of evil violence. John, how are you, good sir? I am fine, thank you for asking, Chris, and I trust you are the same. Oh, I, I, brother, it's absolutely wonderful to meet you. I've got like the Guildford Four and all that sort of stuff and the, the hunger strikes and everything. My first thought was, look, we've got to have a chat. We had a bit of a tumultuous year last year because <clears throat> the the event you alluded to was the, well, is known as the Old Shop Bombing. It's kind of been airbrushed largely from from uh, history, but it was the narration was that it was the reprisal attack for the events known as Bloody Sunday, and it was a um, an attack on a garrison camp, a camp within the garrison Oldshaw. Three weeks after Bloody Sunday, uh, intended to target the particular unit involved, a very famous unit held in a high regard, the parachute regiment. Uh, a, a regiment that you have great respect for, obviously being a uh, former Marine. They now work together a hell of a lot, um, but back in the day, the paras were kind of a bit, bit of a pariah in the army. They weren't uh, particularly well liked by the rest of the army. They had an elitist attitude, understandably so, because the training was hard. Mm. We, many people know what happened to Bloody Sunday. Obviously, there's two sides. One side says that they were fired upon and they returned fire, but ultimately... It came out that you know a bunch of protesters at a civil rights march, uh, their lives were ended that day. It had massive repercussions around the world for the Republican cause, and the fact that perhaps some people might say the fact that a reprisal attack was mounted with relative success so shortly afterwards uh, certainly raised a lot of questions for me. And at the time, I was a month shy of my seventh birthday, mm -hmm. and. All I'd known was being raised within parachute regiment garrisons, you know, going on different postings. And for me, the parachute regiment was Superman. You know, it was my dad and my oldest brother. And the, the event took place three week, weeks after Bloody Sunday. There was apparently no security. I'm led to believe, and I'm only going on what I've been told, that the guard room log for that particular day went missing. There was no security. There was no apparently no warning although my one of my brothers went to collect my mum's wages and couldn't get access to the building because he was told oh we've had a bomb threat and you know somebody had to let him in he got mum's wages and, and went home as i say as a child it, it didn't it didn't add up i mean on top of the confusion of understanding why you go to school one day your mum's been murdered and you, you don't know why or how or whatever so it's raised a lot of questions and being realistic, Chris, it's 51 years later. There's a lot to be said for the fact that it was never it was never addressed during the Bloody Sunday Inquiry. Now, if this was purported to be the, re the reprisal attack, there should have been a nod to it. One of my brothers was very vocal in trying to get it addressed, really, get this, you know, why is nobody mentioning this? And that was unsuccessful, and uh, it really rankled him. Um, over a long period. The, the, the Bloody Sun Inquiry went on over 12 years. John, could you uh, enlighten our friends at home? What Because we've got youngsters watching that won't know what Bloody Sunday was or, or people that aren't familiar with the Northern Ireland Troubles. Well, the Troubles, 
from my understanding, go back way, way, way longer than, than we acknowledge. Um, it, it goes back 800 years or so. Um, but recently, the, the recent period of trouble started in the late 60s. There was tensions between the Protestant loyalist community, primarily, and the Catholics, who in numbers were in favour of Northern Ireland becoming part of Southern Ireland and, and being reunited into one country. Initially, the uh, the British government deployed uh, security there to protect the Catholics from attacks from the Protestants. But as time wore on, the animosity moved from uh, by the Catholics from the uh, Protestants who were potentially attacking them to having an issue with the government forces that were allegedly there to protect them. And, and that's how we know that the troubles uh, became what we now we now remember. Uh, the IRA primarily taking on government forces, Protestants and Catholics fighting between themselves. And a, you know, a real mess for over 30 years and cost a lot of lives, damaged a lot of lives uh, and ended with peace talks, as these things always do. But it just took everybody a long time to get there. And as, as we now know, the whole the whole process is probably on a little bit shaky ground uh, recently. But yeah, that's that's Bloody Sunday was a civil rights march on uh, I think it was thirty first of January nineteen seventy one, and the Catholic stroke uh, Republican community felt they weren't getting decent housing, they weren't getting job opportunities, and they were basically second class citizens, and uh, they organise a civil rights march. That turned into a riot and the response from the armed forces was, yeah, it, it had repercussions. I mean, 14 people at the end of the day were dead. Uh, the, the repercussions, as I said, went around the world. It basically increased mm. support for the Republican cause and money and recruitment within Northern Ireland to Republican uh, terrorist organisations. So it was a big own goal, really, for the for the British. Um, I'm not denigrating the the powers. I mean, you'd have to question why so soon after the Bally Murphy incident, when the one power were involved in, in another incident, not so well publicised, would you then bring them in as potential peacekeepers if, in case things go pear shaped? When that's going to obviously uh, rile the uh, Republican people. Just, I'm just a synopsis for friends at home. Allegations were from the uh, Republican side of things that the Paris had opened up unnecessarily and shot dead 14 innocent people. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. obviously the Paris are going to say, no, we saw we, we were fired upon first. Um, to know exactly what happened, you'd obviously have to be there and even if you were you probably still wouldn't know the full picture and what i always say is it's war folks it's horrible we got to stop having the wars then we won't have these you know debates or or, or, or whatever they are 51 years the catholics still feel that they haven't got justice which which uh no doubt they they haven't the truth is somewhere in the middle, isn't it? That's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's often the case. Yeah, it's often the case. But this, this, for me, this came to light last year. It was the 50th anniversary. And I used to attend the uh, memorial services, which were organised by the, the Parachute Regiment Association. And my feeling personally was that it became a military celebration uh, of, of the Parachute Regiment which, okay, you can understand that, but in the great scheme of things, only one serviceman was killed in the, the car bomb. The remainder were uh, five civilian waitresses and a semi-retired gardener. Unfortunately, I, I knew all the, the women, um, some better than others. My mum was, was amongst them, and she was a single parent. She left behind uh, three relatively young boys plus an older boy that was already enlisted in the parachute regiment following in our father's footsteps and it had uh, obviously had big repercussions uh, which which remain to this day 
But attending the memorial on the 50th year was important because it was, I wanted to attend, never, never go there again. It was, I was going to draw the line under it. I accepted there were a lot of unaccept, uh, unanswered questions. There's, there's not really a, a memorial in place. There was a memorial, an impromptu memorial made of a little concrete stump and a brass plaque, which was made by the other maintenance staff in the camp. So it was never officially given a, a memorial. And some people have been campaigning for that. So this year was the unveiling of a, a stone on which a memorial will be built. That's only now because the land has been sold by the military and is in the hands of residential developers who were told of what had happened there. And it was them themselves that said, well, we should commemorate that. We should have a memorial gardens and a suitable memorial. Uh, <laughs> what I wanted to do was no, nobody that's directly involved was ever allowed to speak. There was just a guy, an ex-para smashing fella, who was a young Tom at the time, and he, he gives his account of the, of the events of the day. Could, we, could, could you tell us them, John, so people at home know, get a better idea of what we're talking about? Right, OK. Well, as, as I said before, my brother claims, who's, who's no longer with us now, he claims that he went to the building on the Friday before the, the bombing, on the 22nd of February, uh, that was the, the following Tuesday, to collect mum's wages. She'd been off work. Uh, she was experiencing depression because her and my old man had split up uh, about a year or so before. Uh, she was old school, so it was a it was a big deal for her. Ironically, a Catholic, very very staunch Catholic, and he was not allowed to enter the officers' mess, which is obviously as you know where the officers will dine and they they have a room upstairs maybe. And, and he was a your dad was a para, was he? Yeah, he was a sergeant of the paras, although he wasn't. He wasn't there at the time. He was stationed at, at the end of his career. He was come to the end of his 22 years in the Paris. He was old at Arborfield, which is the Remy um, training centre, just teaching young recruits. So he wasn't there. My old, my other brother was on a, he was in the Paris, but he was on a, I think he was on a PTI's course or something, not far from the camp. So a guy or somebody drove a car bomb into the garrison into the camp where 16 Airborne Brigade were stationed. Part of the car was unchallenged. There were no checkpoints, no fences, no roadblocks. Again, three weeks after Bloody Sunday. Um, he parks the vehicle and presumably he's on a timer and he left, walks back into old shot and got a train back into London. You know, although there were no measures to try and prevent it, the guy was caught up with relatively shortly afterwards and he was a protestant unlike the majority of people fighting the republican cause they tend to be catholics he was also uh, more interestingly he wanted a united island under a socialist government now if you cast if you're old enough to cast your mind back and i'm not but i do know history in 1971 72 73 before the ira or the current or the most recent campaign came to fruition, that the big bogeyman was communism. So you have to ask, well, okay, if this guy is put in prison or whatever, whether he whether he was involved in this or not, who benefits? You know, uh, do, do the do the British get rid of somebody who might be a thorn in the side? Because he was not a, he was not a conventional sleeper. He was quite active in union activities in. London, where he lived, and he was an outspoken socialist, I understand. Um, but the pieces don't really, really fit. And again, I didn't serve, I didn't serve in Northern Ireland, thankfully. I uh, was not permitted to. The Marine side, that is a, a, an issue uh, which wouldn't progress. Can we, I, I know this is a horrible thing to discuss, but I mean, what, how much explosives was in that vehicle? I think it was a uh, 50 50 pounds in a Ford Cortina. Okay, uh, well, right, Semtex or something, or um, I, 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 I've no, I've no. No, idea. it doesn't. It, it doesn't matter. It's only there's people out there will know this this technical stuff better than you and I. We used to measure it in the old days that if it was a fertilizer bomb, like a homemade explosive, you needed quite a lot for 
you know, they used to use a lot and it obviously went boom. If it was Semtex, which was kind of industrially right, yeah. manufactured, it was mm -hmm. a, a small amount could really do a lot but, of damage. But this car just went went up i'm um, i'm guessing and your your mother the the other four women were walking past uh the... i believe that they were actually having a cup of coffee in a in their kind of staff room on the other side of the wall from where the car was parked i could be wrong uh but i know that <clears throat> my, my mother was identified apparently by a piece of her scalp and her red hair so it, the the bomb blast was quite profound and it was heard all over i was shot and i know that Again, uh, one of my brothers was at school and he heard it from uh, a couple of miles away where he was at school. So a lot of everybody that I was shot heard it. And as I say, it was the first uh, bombing on the mainland of that period. I think since probably after the Second World War, Edwardian times when the IRA had done a few things, but it was the first mainland bombing, mm. which was even more pu puzzling to think that there was no... It was not recognised. It's now sort of blurred into into history. Did so, you get to hear of the bomb first, and then to hear of 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 the of your mother's death, or did, was it the you know? Did someone tell you at the same time? No. Basically, what happened? I I was because of uh, family circumstances. Me and me and my two slightly older brothers were quite feral. Um, I, I would sometimes not go to school, but I, I came home from school. The house was locked and uh, there was nobody about, which was unusual. There was always somebody about. So I went next door and uh, spent time with my neighbour's kids who were my age. And then my dad came walking down the back garden. Uh, I, just, I just made out his arm with a, an army uh, uniform on. And he talked to my neighbour, uh, a woman, uh, De Deborah. And uh, I heard her sobbing. No, still no idea what's going on. Um, and the old man just walked into their living room where I was on the floor playing with the kids or whatever, with, with my mates. And he said, come on, go, we've got you know, pack, we, we're going. So we went next door to our house or where me, mum and my brothers were living. And uh, the other brothers turned up. There was a lot of bleary eyes and a lot of mumbling, but nobody actually said anything. And I just packed some gear and went to my dad's house which was in an adjacent garrison about 20 miles away. Mm. Um, but then I saw the news on the TV as we were all sitting in the living room and I saw where mum worked with bits of cars everywhere and curtains flapping in the wind. And again, still, I, I knew that was where she worked, but I didn't, I mean, I was seven, so I didn't know what, I had no idea what was going on. And it was only, it was only later that, the full extent of what happened, or the reasons why Mum was no longer there, was uh, became clearer. And I mean, you've already gone through a lot because your parents have separated, which is I think anyone that's been through that will know is 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 it is different now. Back then. It wasn't managed well. Now it's quite normal. People get together and they split up and I'm sure it's not nice for the children. But back then it was sort of a rarity. And when it happened, your world was ripped apart because parents didn't know how to manage it appropriately. It was just, mm. we're splitting up. Well, funny you, enough, and yeah, you're right. Sorry to interject, Chris. You're right. But from our, from our point of view, uh, with the benefit of, you know, like maturity such as I have it, I understand that my dad was the product of a very disadvantaged background, you know, the proper gear, Yorkshire orphanages, you know, borderline workhouse. So he was raised a certain way and he had to survive. And in, in his mind, he thought he was on a bound to raise his boys to face whatever life could throw at you. There was no, no room for lovey-dovey stuff. It was like the world was a shit place. You've got to be ready. Now that was quite cruel at the time but as the older i get i think jesus christ he, he wasn't wrong you know <laughs> he wasn't wrong there's some bad stuff out there but when mum and dad split up and he went and married a younger woman for us it was a relief because you know the house was going to potentially be a bit more normal you know not not there was a lot of violence in the house put it that way um if you come from that background, as my dad did, and you joined the parachute regiment, he was also a commando during the war. And, 
uh, in the army commandos before they were disbanded and the commando role was given exclusively to the Royal Marines uh, and he couldn't adjust after the war. He won the Croix de Guerre as well, which was a French mm-hmm. medal. Can I, I think we just got to say that the there's they're still army commandos just for all the people that are leapt off their seats. <laughs> no, no, of course, the army commandos are obviously do the, the commando course and then serve with the Marines to give them support. But in those days, there was like number three army commando. Number yes, one army commando. yes, I've got you. Um, so yeah, he, he he didn't settle down after the war, so he did a further 22 years in the in the parachute regiment, did Suez and Aden and um, all these sort of places. So, but when he but when they split up, we thought it was a new dawn. It was you know we were going to have a bit more normality, uh, but obviously that was curtailed once once the incident happened in old shop. What I was alluding to is like you've been through a lot for a, for a little lad anyway, and and did did you understand that your mum had died? Did you understand at that moment that she's not coming back? Yes, yes, but. You know, I mean, if it had been a, you know, not this was not this in anybody who's if it's a car crash or a you know a natural disease, then you don't you're not saying handle it any differently, but you know where to where to box it, and uh, you don't go to school with many people whose mom, mothers have died in a as a result of a car bomb by apparently Irish people. Well, Irish people look like me; they, they talk like I do. You, you know, what, what are terrorists? What are gorillas? What does that mean? Why would somebody waiting tables get blown up? It just, so it was beyond my comprehension. Um, and I think as I've, I've done a, an interview before, and as I said, it the, the primary thing was survival. Everything had changed. My brothers were taken away somewhere else. I went to live with my dad and his, his uh, new wife up north. So it was a complete change of, of picture. So just everything kicked into survival, just uh, keeping out of the way, keeping a low profile, um, trying to be invisible. <laughs> just, you know, because obviously, um, not obviously, but sometimes people that you end up with are not best pleased with you being, being there, uh, your service requirements. So you just got to crack on and do the best you can to, to, to bring yourself up. So you saying your your dad's met this uh, married a younger woman and mm. and they they you weren't part of their plans. No. Yeah. No. no and so- I, I I just want to get to I mean I uh, one of my earliest memories John is my old man driving us 300 miles from home. First like our mum just was gone when we come home one day. Then it's like few days past the old man says right get in a car or was it no it's a mini mini minivan like no windows in it or no where does the kids lie in, in in drives 300 miles up to lincolnshire which is where my mother had uh absconded to 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 be with her mum on the way up my sister's got this little tape player and she's playing ab i think it was uh abba and m- my sister looks at my dad and says dad this song's about you and mummy. Oh. And I could see my dad just gripping the steering wheel, right? My sister hasn't, she doesn't know what's going on. I know what's, even though I'm the younger one, I I know what's going on. We got 300 miles. Uh, my dad, we, we get out on the pavement. My dad just drops our bags and bear in mind, I've never seen my dad cry. Also, he's never hugged me, right? He just grabs me. Not my, my sister's already run inside. She's oh, I'm going to go and see mummy and grandma. You know, she she's. Uh, my, I'm just left with my dad on the pavement. I I know what's happening, and obviously my dad does. And he just he he he, he grabbed me. He gave me a hug. He said, "I love you so much, son." And he literally jumped into the driver's seat, drove off, and I'm I'm just and he's waving out the window like that. He, in them days, it was unheard of. You didn't drive three hundred miles and then jump in the car and drive three hundred back. But this is how f- horrible that you know he just he couldn't he he didn't want ugh ugh. Anyway, he's off there. I'm stood there. 
And my mum comes out. She says, where's your father? And you're going to stop for a cup of tea. And that was it. To see how, like, is it only me and my dad understand the seriousness of this situation? We're never going to see our dad again. He's how, never... how old were you, Chris? Oh, oh maybe se seven, maybe. You know, we ne in your mind, you're never going to see your dad again. Mm. And in his mind, his kids have been taken. And I'm not, I'm not blaming me, my, 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 my dear old mum, mum here. But I'm, um, I'm just saying, John, that I remember, you know, the, and that's just one of many. You know, that's probably the one of the incidents I can say on camera. There's a lot of other stuff that 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 wasn't so, you know, wasn't so uh, top tier. You can say, um, and so I'm just thinking of you as this little lad you're already in this traumatic situation and now you've just you you like your mum ain't coming back i mean do you go home and cry cry yourself to sleep or or well no there, there was um i mean this is possibly easier to talk about than you may imagine chris because i thought about little else in the last 50 years really trying to analyze it how i feel why i feel that way like you've done in a way there you compare your experience to other people not because because you need to know there are other people that go through stuff. It might not be the same, but, you know, you look at them, they survived. You know, I, I need to find a way to survive this. Um, the thing with, with mum was, um, ironically, before she was killed, uh, she gave me a bit, of a bit of a hiding. I mean, she was old school. She wasn't, you know, pictures on the fridge and, you know, she, she used to dish, dish it out a bit, but she, she was an old school mum. And she'd give me a bit of a bit of a hide in for something or other. And but we were very, very Catholic. I say we. The house was very Catholic. There was Mother Mary's and Hello Dollies and all sorts of things over the house, all over the house everywhere. And mum, mum religiously went to church. And I went to bed all battered and, and a bit bruised. And I was like, I hate, it. I really hate, it. I wish he was dead, I wish he was dead. And then when it happened on the Tuesday, my mind thought. Jesus Christ, somebody was listening to me. So, you know, I've, had a, I've, I've had a wish granted. God, that was my fault. Because it was so outlandish. It wasn't a, how did a car, where did a car bomb come from? What's a car bomb? And so I kind of blame myself. I remember thinking, how am I going to tell my brothers what I've done? So when I moved up north and lived with um, my stepmother and the father, I started having nightmares. The stepmother was having her own issues. She was an alcoholic. Uh, substance abuse was an issue. And she had mental health issues for which she was sectioned almost as soon as we got up there. And she would just run in the room if I woke up uh, and just punch me in the face. So then I learned that, okay, I don't want to have nightmares, but I also need to keep it quiet if I do. So and I wasn't the only one getting a bad, bad time there. She had a daughter a couple of years younger than me and um, there was a newborn baby which is a product of my dad and this, this woman. And, you know, it was not it was not exactly the Waltons, put it that way. So it's, um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a difficult thing. Plus, I miss my brothers because they had been part of my life and they were my mentors. I looked up to them and I didn't see them for up to a year at a time. Uh, in the early days and we we, we, we we ended up growing apart as the years went by and they were trying to survive they were 13 and 15 and they were moving about with different people in London and just trying to survive um, they couldn't really do anything about my situation when you look back John do you realise now that your reason for uh, let's just call it not not fitting into the training pattern although i'm sure you had every you know everything that all the rest of us have got do you realize that that was related to your childhood trauma it was complicated by a lot of things okay i was i was a I don't know the polite, polite way to put it i was an idiot you know I, I i was not composed of good experiences most kids have demanding times but i was um i was in all sorts of a mess um, I hated the world and its dog. I should have gone in the paras and followed my brothers into the paras and I was invited up and spent um, a week with one para and did some training with them. But 
the Marines was an option to do something that was perceived as, as testing, but go my own way, do my own thing. And initially, I was very fit. I, I, I was doing boxing and training and whatever, so the fitness was not a problem. But then I didn't expect the level of ill feeling between the Marines and the Paras immediately after the Falklands, which obviously is abated over the last 40 years. But there was, there was a lot of rivalry. When I got there, it was not a problem. I mean, the training team initially, 180 was my troop. They were phenomenal. Hard, I mean, really hard. But nobody really paid much attention to the fact that, you know, I was from a family of, 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 of Paras. Uh, but then I got injured. Uh, messing about with another guy who <clears throat> completed training. He went on to serve with SB. He was very good. For, I won't name him for obvious reasons. He was a smashing lad. You know, the, the full ticket, very fit. And we were boxing. He was showing me some improving techniques in boxing. Uh, although I could box, I wasn't like him. And I was showing him a few judo throws. throws. And because we were doing it slow, he started pissing about my knee ripped and the, the ligaments and I became detached and a bit crunch. Now the, the initial training team thought I was fit enough to, to recover and get back into the training team, uh, into that troop, mm. but it was, it was not going to happen. Uh, you appreciate Chris that the training rot ratchets, ratchets up and becomes more physically demanding. Uh, and once I got back into the troop after about eight weeks, it's nowhere near it. I was nowhere near it. And then I started getting demotivated. I mean, I had everything that was needed. I, I was, I, I excelled. But then the attitude started changing. I started feeling alienated. And then incredibly, I didn't find this, find this out for a couple of years, but one of my brothers <clears throat> phoned up a random part of the training team at Limston from where he, wherever he was. He was a colour sergeant, one para. And he claimed, uh, I just want to know how my brother's getting on. And this guy didn't. It was not nothing to do with my training team. And he just said, well, I, I mean, he's doing okay. He gets a little bit of bother, but, you know, he's getting over his injury now and whatever. And it's, it's somehow apparently descended into a, well, send him up here where he belongs. He should be with the powers, not with you lot, waste his time. And it, it got a bit, you know, handbags, really. And I was down on the bottom field with my troop and running about and doing fireman's care. And this random guy came out of the training centre, asked who I was, I put my hand up, and he just came over and gave me the hairdryer treatment for five minutes. I'm really going for it. I thought, who the hell is this guy? I don't know him from a box, you know, bar of soap. And it puzzled me. And even the guys around me were looking, what's well, this guy? You know, just uh, if you want to go to the powers, you can piss off and I'll keep my eye on you. And, and it was the first real animosity I'd had, you know, apart from being told that you're being a dickhead or, you know, you haven't done this properly. And I was puzzled. And then years after, a couple of years after I came out, I was having a talk with this brother and we were having a couple of drinks. And he, he told me what happened. I said, are you joking? Did you, you phoned up and had an argument with a member of the training team? I said, do, do you realise the amount of shit I got for that? You know, it was just, and then it was, open day really because word spread and and um I yeah john that's um that's a bit that's harsh man you know that's uh, after the i think ah uh, it's this is always a funny one right every time i uh chat to a para particularly on the show he's always like within five minutes that they, they bring up the rivalry and and I, I i i say every time all the time i was in the marines right we we look down on the army that that's just a given in you know that that that's um that's just like a given but honestly rural marines don't for the seven years i was in they didn't spend their time slagging off the paras. They just never even mentioned them, mate. Honestly, mm. I, we worked with them in Ireland. They were great. They were aggressive, mm. more more so than us. We mm. we were mm. we, we. You have to keep a rein on Marines. Mm. 
you know, I've, I've told this story before during our Northern Ireland training, we shot the range to pieces. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, you got to check that behavior, but, um, I can imagine back then, though, after the Falklands, having a para phone up your, you know, your training team, and and possibly stirring things up a bit. Yeah, well, yeah, it's just whatever it was. I'm sure you're sure he meant nothing by it. Um, it's, uh, yeah, bad luck, mate. <laughs> Well, no, it wasn't like at the end of the day, I was doing a good enough job of screwing things up myself because I could get in a fight in a phone box on my own. I, I was a night there. I had a big chip on my shoulder. And, he, and all credit to the uh, training teams that I met down there. They were great. And, and looking back at first, when we parted a company, uh, I, I did some physio and I got fit again and I joined the army. I knew I couldn't do anything as physically demanding as that again because, as it turned out, the, the injury reoccurred several times. But it was a blessing. It gave me a really good kick up the arse. I think any training like that, paras, marines, guards, testing training, teaches you a lot about yourself. In some ways, you learn that you're a bit harder than you thought. In some ways, you're you know, you're not. You know, you really do find out a lot about yourself, um, good and bad. And it probably takes a few years. You, you might have done the same, Chris, where it's not until you look back with a more mature viewpoint in Christ, you know, I understand that now. That's why that did me good. I didn't appreciate it at the time. For me, what happened to the Marines was a massive rejection, a massive failure on my part, because I would, I'd always wanted to belong to something that I perceived as worth belonging to. And I was really impressed with the Marines. And it's, it's to my regret that it didn't pan out. But having said that, had I taken my place as that young man, I don't know what the ramifications would have been because I was not, I was not on the races mentally. I had too many issues, too many things that I was carrying with me. Mm. Although I could run, I could carry weight, I could climb up uh, ropes. But as you alluded to there, you know, you need a bit of, thought you need to be able to control yourself to some extent you need to be able to work things through and i was a you know i was a bit too reactive so i think the marines made a good decision and that's it's, it's stood me in good stead yeah no regrets though mate you know past is the past we live in the present don't we and we mm. keep, I, had a, keep... I had a brilliant time chris as i yeah. said a brilliant time it, it, it was unlike anything i'd ever done um, and it was enjoyable. In fact, that's why I moved down to this part of the world because I fell in love with the area. Um, and I've always wanted to live down here. I now live in the southwest. So, yeah, you can look back and regret, but I think you're probably somebody who believes that everything does eventually happen for a reason. You don't appreciate it at the time, but it's the universe or whatever guiding you towards whatever choice you have to make next or whatever task or challenge you're going to face next. I want to come back about, uh, John, we'll talk about the justice um, ramifications of what mm -hmm. happened to, 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 to your mum. Mm -hmm. But your, you told me a story about your, your, your brother, Carl, was it a bit of a standoff with the police? We all dealt with what happened to, to mum in different ways, being different characters. Um, and Carl, I never really got the measure of what he was up to. He was always very angry. He was always probably the most dramatic one out of all of us. He, he subsequently joined three para. <clears throat> and funnily enough, like like me, the, the paras of my other two brothers, they, they did serve in Northern Ireland. Carl in three para, um, apparently the para said, you know, we won't be taking you to Ireland with us. So he had a real bee in his bonnet about the whole bloody Sunday inquiry in, in in regards to it not making any mention of the reprisal attack. Um, and he kept asking questions at the time, and this is early 90s when the bloody Sunday inquiry started. And he was writing to MPs and newspapers, and, well, why is nobody mentioning what happened to these women? You know, these people that were, were whose lives were ended as a result of this. And nobody was interested. Now, you have to look at it and say, well, the bloody Sunday inquiry is a, a means to an end. It was a peace process. 
It was part of the peace process, ultimately, to, to, so that community could see justice being done, such as it was. But he was right. Somebody should have tipped a wink to the people who died at Old Shot and given them some kind of acknowledgement. But his frustration boiled over into an armed siege in, in a street in Streatham on a, a railway bridge. I was working in Berlin at the time, 1996, and he was lucky. He, he goaded, he wasn't adversarial towards the police that turned up. It was an armed response unit and they talked him down. They 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 were invited by him to slot him, as, as, as the phrase goes, which, as you know, when the parish use it is, you know, shoot, shoot me. And they were very calm. They were very restrained. He ended up doing a year in prison. But for him, that was the, that was the beginning of the end because although he was ex power and he was quite a hard lad, he was a gifted artist and he was working in advertising in London, trendy art places. So, of course, after he was released from prison, uh, these same people were a little bit less enamoured with working with him because, you know, he had the usual parrot-type face, you know, a bit of a weathered, beaten face. And um, he ended up having to go to do close security work in Iraq. And again, his state of mind meant that, you know, he, he wasn't really suitable. He wasn't sufficiently adjusted to do that. And then alcohol re reared its ugly head. And two years ago, he was found having drunk, him drunk himself to death in his own home in, um, in London. And I think that that was a, a very late victim of the old shot bombing, if you like, because his life was like mine, David's and, and Brian's. It was, it was just survival, just getting by, not getting in trouble. Um, and he had everything going for him. But it all just it fell apart. We weren't on terms when he died. We 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 had a massive fallout, as as brothers do. But um, yeah, he was he was very bothered, very bothered by it. But this is the this is the un un uh, the unknown tally of conflict, isn't it? Yeah, the people that suffer with a mental health and end up either taking their lives or drinking themselves to death. Mm. They, they don't put these in the statistics, do they? Today, this memorial was unveiled as part of a drumhead service commemoration with the names of all seven, Margaret, Gardner John Hassler, Jill Mansfield, Sherry Munton, Father Gerard Weston, Joan Lunn and Thelma Bosley. No, you're right, Chris. And for example, if you take a stereotypical example of a person who's been exposed to horrific things in being in Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever it be, they come back and they struggle to deal with it. And then it's like a ripple effect. It affects their spouse, wife, their husband, boyfriend, their children. And these effects multiply and, and affects a lot of different people. And that's why, as you said earlier, you know, we've got to find a way to stop wars and conflicts. Ordinary people don't want it. You know, they, 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 you can always, all these conflicts eventually get resolved by people sitting around the table. Mm. Yeah, every time. Yeah, uh, uh, after the bankers and, and the warmongers have ma made, ma their money. Ma made their money, mate. And uh, um, your mum was called Thelma. Mm -hmm. Shall I read out the names of the people that were mm -hmm. killed just to, out of respect? So we've got uh, the Reverend Father Jerry E. Weston, M MBE. We've got your mother, Thelma Bosley, Margaret Grant, John Hasler, Joan Lunn, Jill Mansfield. I think that's Cherry Munton. Uh, rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I knew I knew all the girls, definitely. I, I would have known John Hasler, the gardener. But I used to go to work with my mum, and uh, as I say, I was a six-year-old kid, and you'd climb about on their knees, and they'd cover you in lipstick. And... Did the IRA accept the blame for this, re uh, the responsibility for <clears throat> this, John? Apparently, the official IRA uh, admitted responsibility. There was the provisional IRA, the official IRA. Now, if you can imagine, or for people that are watching this back in the day, the troubles were just re-emerging, if you will. 
and the IRA had different splinter groups and different people with different agendas within that Republican organisation. They were vying for supremacy, if you like. Again, older people uh, that have a similar background to you and I who have been in the forces and, and served in Northern Ireland in the early days in services will no doubt know that there were things that went on behind the scenes and deals struck and lines of communication that might not surprise people. But this that, that conflict and that situation is no different. Um, Do you want to um, enlighten us? Because I can tell you a few things that I've heard just, <laughs> just through doing this job. So, for example, Good Friday Agreement. Why did suddenly people that would never sign up to a peace deal suddenly sign up? Apparently, it's because they were getting an, they was getting stuff out of it, John. Yes, you know, there's always, getting, there's, um, there's, a, there's always a payback. Yeah, not payback. not that we don't wish and pray for peace because that's that you know it's that's that's the way it's got to be for the ch for the children and the next generations, but. Um, what uh, and also, I mean that, that there's a film, Fifty Dead Men Walking, I believe it's called. It's about the it's about the informants that were controlled in in the province. So these are the informants for the Br British forces, government, pol police, but um, it, it, you know the s secret services, basically. Um, mm. and there's an interesting bit. Uh, so you've got handlers, and then you've got the informants. Does this make sense? Yeah, yes, the, ha course, ha yeah. handlers. We, we've had Bernie on the show. Bernie's former Royal Marine. He's he's been a handler. He was a handler in Afghanistan, and you know you manage local people. Um, the assets, the assets, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. And I believe in fifty dead men walking. From what I remember, at the end after all these shenanigans going on through the film and near death experiences and people, you know, if you say one wrong word as an informant or as a handler, it triggers suspicion. It, it can trigger suspicion. You can prematurely set off in an event that screws up like months worth of intelligence work yeah. or to the other side of the fence months worth of planning for a, you know, um, for a bomb event or something like that. And um, at the end of that film, <laughs> shouldn't laugh, but this is the irony of the world. It 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 turns out that they're all being controlled by London, the <laughs> the, the, py the pyro. I mean, I mean, um, yes, yes. I, I'm not saying that. I'm no, just... no, nothing would surprise me, Chris. Nothing would surprise you. Let's be honest. Yeah. The more you uncover, the further you go down rabbit holes, and it doesn't matter what topic you look at, which shapes policy or whatever or outcomes. There, there are a few grubby fingers in a few grubby places. Some might say that there were unofficial rules, if you like, that, that came to fruition so far as the British side and the Republican side agreed that, for example, certain people were, were, were out of bounds, off limits, as targets, perhaps um, royalty. But, of course, that was um, not the case when a certain person was... Uh, dispatch by means of a bomb on a on a boat in a lake in Northern Ireland, and um, do you, can I just chip in there and say, do you, have you heard the latest on that? The late, the latest buzz. <laughs> what about the potentials? Well, the suspicions of well, activities at an adjoining uh, it, boarding it, school. It, it was that I don't know if we've been a bit naughty saying this but i think it, uh, it it's common not it's public knowledge so it, it, a certain person was you know fiddling with people that he shouldn't have been there we go um for for uh, you know re repeatedly through and um it it makes you question who put the bomb on that boat was it london or or <laughs> indeed yeah absolutely i mean it was it's funny chris sorry to interject but I, I won't go into the story, if you don't mind, I won't go into the stories that were related to me over the years by my proximity to people that had served there and, you know, friends and, you know, whatever. But some things went on that were not really uh, stuff that you'd see in the news. Uh, that's notwithstanding, we all know that the Republican side 
committed some awful atrocities. I mean, we've, we've, we've been talking about one. So, as you said, wars are was a very uh, messy and horrific thing. But it's also full of treachery and double dealing. And, you know, we will give this version of events to, to our side and when, when, in fact, that version of events isn't the reality. And I think people know this now. They're not willing to just go through the books in your classroom and this is what happened. And, you know, more and more questions are being are being raised. But I the, the Irish troubles, the problems, whatever you want to call it, was very complex, very complex. There were lots of different uh, sides. There was um, the religious aspect, the, the historic. Now, the English, we, we look at the troubles as being the last sort of 40, 50 years. With the Irish, because they have a history of storytelling, they pass that, you know, their culture is a big thing to them. They have a different version. They're, they're their issues go back way longer, hundreds of years, uh, with lots of pretty unpleasant events, which they still remember vividly. Um, it's it's a strange one, Chris, as, as, as all conflicts are. There's 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 very little positive to take out of these things. At the end of the day, yeah, there's so many uh, things need looking into don't they for example who who supplies all the drugs in ireland you know into the north there was a certain person it doesn't he he's no longer with us um so i won't say his name but let's just say he was at the table for the good friday agreement mm -hmm. that uh allegedly when we were in belfast he he was the you know the guy bringing it all into the into the country but you know the weapons. Da, 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 is it's ah, it you know pa power corrupts an absolute power, power corrupts, corrupts absolutely, absolutely. Whether that's power from selling stuff or power from being in power. Um, let's talk about the John. Um, it. How does it feel to you that this incident has kind of? It, it, it's been like what steamrolled into the past can we say yeah very much so very much so i mean me and a, well i know i've been campaigning from for, for an appropriate memorial to be on the site now i've been involved with some other people with to that regard because the site's now been redeveloped it's uh, quite a nice housing estate and the developers grangers are going to build a memorial garden in the middle of the estate at the location with a memorial, obviously a, a monument uh, to be decided. Now, ironically, my brother who, who died a couple of years ago, when he stopped doing the close protection work and he put his feet back on the ground, he ended up being a telescopic forklift driver. He wasn't telescopic, the forklift was. And he, he worked on the site as it was being built, and he brought this to the attention of the developers and said, look, do you know what happened here, guys? And they said, well, no, we need to explain. I mean, this is, I mean, you virtually couldn't make this stuff up. And he said, well, look, you know, this, this was a, there was a car bomb left here and these people died. And um, they said, well, as I said to you earlier, they, they said, well, we're going to have to commemorate that. Now, my interest was having this removed from a celebration of all things military. Old shots got that pretty well covered. You know, there are statues everywhere. It's a garrison town. And I thought, wouldn't it be good to turn this around and say, well, there's, there's people going to be making their homes here. You know, it's a new community. Have it as a, a memorial by all means, but let's look to it for something better. You know, a, a, a monument to the mistakes of the past, what we were doing wrong in the past. A memorial to better things to come, educating our kids better, you know, and any future memorial should be a, a coming together. No bands, no bugles, no speeches from dignitaries with big feathers in their hats and all that. They were totally unrelated to that. Oh, now, that, that John, John, sorry, I just want to chip in because uh, uh, we had a, 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 a very good chap on a podcast recently, Paul Cardin, and he he really went under the surface with the whole Falklands conflict. 
And he unearthed so much stuff that the public don't know to the point of, you know, criminality, basically. Um, and I think it's everyone's duty, especially veterans, to if you find out some, you know, we should all be against war. Absolutely. It's not it's nonsense. It's nonsense. It, it, it's the same twisted um, manipulation of young, naive go-getting young people used to be predominantly young men, but I hope people understand what I'm saying. It's just, it's, it's the same like twisted plot that they bring out every single time. There's a bogeyman over there. You, 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 you've got to go and get them. Oh, by the way, we're just going to, you know, kill a whole load of people in the meantime. And then, and then there's the peace thing when everyone's made them, their money. Their so money, Paul, yeah. Paul, Paul done a great job. I mean, for example, just give people an example in his book, which is called Return to Bomb Alley, um, he highlights that 80% of the Falklands is owned by a private corporation, not the Falkland Islanders. You know, just just little things like that. Chile had a peace deal on the table that conveniently Margaret Thatcher overlooked. Can we disregard? You disregard know, it. Yeah, yeah. Didn't didn't click, didn't announce publicly that they disregarded. But you're, you're somebody who's made made a, an adult career, if you like, of of realising these things, of, of going against your initial upbringing and going to war and training in, within a good unit to go to war. What, what you're alluding to, I think, is that there's a great raft of dispossessed people, young. Take the UK, you know, your, your depressed towns, your dysfunctional families. And if you look at it, for a society like Britain, if we want to get the best out of these kids, you know, youngsters as we once were, is this the best we can do? We can train you. We can put you in a uniform. and then we can send you off overseas, wherever it is. And it's no different from the First World War, from, you know, to do these things which profit massive companies. And we'll tell you it's for this and it's for freedom and it's for – it very rarely is. It very rarely yeah. is. And, you know, again, removing the war aspect, is this the best any society can do? Can't, couldn't we imagine training kids up, educating them, giving them technical skills, practical skills, and say, right, go to less developed parts of the world. Don't convert them to your religion or ram that down their throat. Just help them, well, this is how we, this is how we construct things in our part of the world. This will last for a long time. This is water irrigation. This is whatever. I did little bits of that in the Royal Engineers in Kenya, in a, in a later, in a later career, and it's, it was and it was really fulfilling. It was really good. You actually mix with the people, uh, Samburu tribes people, you know, ordinary people, and see how they live, and you interact with them. You're not shooting anybody, mm. you know, and it it's just a shame that that's the best we can do, you know. That's but. One thing I will, I, this is kind of a bit left field, Chris, but a couple of years ago, I was watching the Remembrance Service. Um, and I'll just say, John, that's the point that Paul makes. When you talked about uh, a, a statue and a monument, it Paul just highlights how on Remembrance Sunday up at the Cenotaph, you get all these politicians, for example, that turn up the very people that sent our youngsters off to die knowingly, you know, I mean, Tony Blair's com com common knowledge, knowingly falsi falsifying um, intelligence in order to support what I call a big club, mm. right? And mm. then you get this Remembrance Sunday where Tony Blair steps up to present a reef the the exact same guy that sent these people to their deaths so he could get rich. Okay. I actually believe he's sort of a in in a way a victim. I think he just got in way over his head. Uh I think because of his own past, he was being blackmailed by the by, you know, the club. Uh, the, the club. Right. And rather than just hold his hand up and say, Yeah, look, I got my winky out in a men's toilet once, I'm sorry. He, you know, he, he took us to, to war, John, you know, um, and uh, he, yeah, we're very good, aren't we? At the glorious dead. 
you tell that to the little boy whose daddy didn't come back mm. or the father who's crying in his beer lit you know seen this literally because he he packed his son off to the army he was so proud when his son passed out in that smart uniform and and then he gets sent off to one of these illegal conflicts and he don't come back and mm. and that father's got to live with it it's um with this what i was going to say to you chris may not it may resonate with the, the, the other ex forces people that might be watching this. And I don't mean mean this in any disrespect to anybody, but a thought occurred to me because when I was watching, it was probably about I don't know seven years ago. I was watching the remembrance at, at the at the cenotaph. Now, just before that, there'd been a big expose on the Panama Papers and about people avoiding tax. And one of the main, <laughs> allegedly, one of the main people was the head of our then royal family, uh, of evading trillions of pounds over a given period so i had that in my mind i was watching a member of the royal family lay a wreath on the cenotaph and in the background was rows of uh, very smart looking soldiers male and female navy whatever and then the front row was uh, a line of veterans in wheelchairs some quite young so some clearly from recent conflicts iraq and afghanistan with legs missing arms missing and i thought I bet that a lot of those guys have got those prosthetic limbs because of the efforts of, say, people like you that do these fun runs to assist and, and, and raise money. But I think that wouldn't be needed if the person laying the wreath had been honourable about the contributions they're supposed to make to the state that are there to, unfortunately, facilitate what these people need. They could, of course, facilitate the removal of the need for these guys to go to these places and girls. But I just thought the whole thing was so hypocritical. Forgive me. I would say that obviously you do, you do talk about the um, spirituality and dimensions and all this sort of thing. I think you're a lot above a lot of people that may watch um, your podcast. And I get it. I mean, I'm sure people do, but it, it takes a lot to, to move up that and, and move, move up that scale and not be diverted by the, you know, the the nonsense around you. But yeah, I mean, unless you find something spiritual or something to believe in, something to aspire to that's beyond the crap that's offered, you know, like not not being so quick to blame the people they're telling you are your enemies, be it immigrants, boat people, people of different colours, people of different cultures. You know, when you when it real really boils down to it, you know, we've all got a common enemy. And these these same people pulling the strings. But it's hard, Chris, because you know the biggest weapon that these people or the club of which we you and I are not members is diversion tactics. Keep everybody occupied, keep them worried, keep them in fear. The thing is, Chris, I mean, we 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 automatically think that in order to remove ourselves from this or to improve the situation. We then are trained to become adversarial. We've got to bring this down. We've got to fight those. We've got to have an insurrection. Apparently, we don't. I mean, if 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 people educate themselves, the fact that the laws we live under are bogus, they're bogus. Mm. Um, I know there's lots of things again, confusion, common law, natural law, this, that, and the other. But most societies originally lived under common law, which is do no harm, don't kill people. You know, they're very very small list of rules the law that we live under in the uk and i'm only just educating myself this is is apparently based on maritime law hence you stand in the dock you have a birth certificate and and it's kind of um a bastardization of like legal is not the same as law legal mm -hmm. is these uh, acts that are passed in parliament they have no validity and the only reason they have control over us is because we submit to it and even the police, apparently the police work for a corporation which is registered in the city of London or or wherever. And when they write you to fine you or they do whatever they do, it's an exchange between two corporations. The corporation, which is the police in reality, and the corporation that's been invented when you're born, which is why they apparently address you in capital letters. Yeah, so, they call it legal fiction, don't they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just... Yeah, but um, 
a woman was on um, a podcast explaining she's an Irish lady, um, Dolores... Um, Mc- Dolores Carhill. That's the one. That's the one. And she put it over, over very simply and just said, look, it does take, it does take courage and uh, individuals can't do it on their own. But when enough people realise and just say, look, thanks for that, but uh, we're not, I don't recognise your law. You know, yeah. it, does, it does take it does take some some balls but the whole thing's been a big scam for years and we're so used to it like all the pantomime the wigs and the cloaks and the, the lord and all this it's all it's all distraction it's all distraction yeah it's like these parking fines <laughs> they come through the door you just put return to sender <laughs> right you, well, well hang on I drove my car and you're a random stranger writing to me and I've got to send you 70 quid. How, how the hell does that, um, what, what, sorry, what, what, how have I hurt anybody? <laughs> how, how have I stolen anything from anyone? Who, who did I, you exactly. know, the thing, who, the who did I do over? Uh, I believe that it was absolutely no one. So do you know what? <laughs> you can, you can take your, your letter and you can uh, you can shove it where the sun don't shine but the bottom line is chris again going back to this 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 real law thing you know the, the common law everybody's created equal no 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 one person has dominion over others to, to, to you know according to this to tell people what what or not what not or what to do as long as you're doing no harm you don't intend any harm on anyone you can go about your lawful business but all these increasing barriers to movement to freedom it's it's piecemeal drip drip yeah. and then one day people are gonna wake up and, fuck i'm not allowed to go there i can't go and trip over there what, what happened john one i could chat to you all e- all evening so honestly is it's it's, it's it's great to find a is it kindred spirit? Is that the right expression? Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, and, yeah. And I appreciate uh, John said some very kind stuff about the podcast earlier. For, um, folks very much enjoying it, and that's that's the result we're going for. Have you found your peace? I'm getting there. I'm getting there because I I, I know that the, the the I know what I'm capable of doing, what I'm not. For example, I can't relationships and stuff are difficult for me because I, I, I prefer to be on my own now. I've got a dog. Um, I've got uh, friends and stuff. So I'm happy with that. And you've got to cut your cloth to suit. So, yeah, I'm, I'm as happy as the next man. And like you, working to find a, a better place to be mentally and uh, spiritually. Excellent. You know what they say about women? <laughs> you can't live with them. Can't live without them. And you can't kill him. <laughs> nice to talk to you, Chris. Best of luck. Uh, brilliant, mate. Just stay on the line so I can thank you properly. Friends are at home. Uh, massive thank you to to, to John. Uh, whoa, what a what a what a what is it? So, you know, some people have to go through. Bloody hell, bloody hell. Um, folks, if you can support the podcast, I'd really appreciate it. If you can chuck us a like for this video. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already and click the notification bell. If I could ask you to support us, please, on Patreon for $1.99 a month or become a YouTube member. It's just $1.99 a month. That's all from me. So another uh, thank you to John. Massive love to you all and uh, see you soon.